Oh boy, chapter 33 of Isaiah is what we're going to talk about today, and this one is super relevant to us today. Uh, it's amazing how much Isaiah saw of our day and, and our future of what is coming up for us as well. So let's jump in and get started in understanding this. There's going to be a great contrast in this chapter uh, of, of type of people we are. Um, and it's a lot of good tips and advice and things for us to think about in our day and age and realize what is coming for us and what can we do about that, basically. So verse 1, Woe to thee that spoilest, and thou wast not spoiled, and dealest treacherously, and they that deal not treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. And when thou shalt make an end to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. And this first verse is a heck of a start to just have this, uh, as it says, woe. This is kind of a main thing of beware. Here's a challenge. So those who, basically this one says, if you lie, cheat, and steal, there's going to come a day where people are going to lie, cheat, and steal on you. So you could look at this from a what goes around, comes around type uh, philosophy or idea. We could look at this also to think about um, as, as the world gets more wicked, it's going to become a bigger problem. More of these issues are going to come around. So I think there's the karma idea of what goes around, comes around is an important one to look at and then realize that that wickedness is going to be everywhere. So be careful if you're wicked. Now, verse 2 is going to contrast this. Uh, this is starting to pray to God, as they say in verse 2, O Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Be thou, our, be thou their arm every morning, our salvation in the time of trouble. So this is a prayer where the people, in a way, are praying for strength. So now we see we had a woe to the wicked, uh, basically, that are, that are dealing wickedly with other people. And then we have this idea of uh, people who are righteous, who are praying to God, and they're asking for God for strength, basically. So Isaiah wants God to be our main strength. That's the, the message he wants to get across here. In order for Israel, uh, anciently and in modern times, the house of Israel, to be successful, it needs to be reliant upon God to help us out. Uh, so this is this is that this prayer to ask God for help, basically, because there's lots of wickedness, lots of dealing treacherously, a lot of things that are going on, basically. Uh, verse three: At the noise of the tumult, the people fled. At the lifting up of thyself, the nations were scattered. And your spoil shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar, as the running to and fro of locusts shall he run upon them. The Lord is exalted, for he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, and strength and salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. I want to pause for just a second here as we look at this praise of God that's happening. So we started the chapter talking about problems with rampant wickedness. Then these people are praying, saying, please, God, help us. Help us survive. Help us deal with these hard times. When, when dishonesty is rampant, when there's lots of wickedness and problems. And we know that when you come, when Christ comes, we can, when we put Christ in our life, we can have peace and happiness in our life, as well as when he comes the second time, we have more peace and happiness in our life. So this is, as he's talking about, he hath filled Zion. So Zion is a physical place that is coming in Jackson County, Missouri is where we know more about it. Uh, but Zion also is where the saints are gathered and they are unified in his name. That is Zion. So wherever the saints are, they're are opportunities for prosperity and, and happiness. And that is important for us to think about. Uh, verse 7, in fact, Behold, their valiant ones shall cry without. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. Now this is again talking about Zion. But there, I mean, you think about it. If you, have, if you are an ambassador for peace, if your job is to promote peace to everybody around you, 
and you are weeping bitterly, why? Most likely it's because there is no peace. There is just rampant problems and chaos around you. And this is a challenge that, uh, that Zion is going to face. There's going to be, in the last days, there's going to be Zion. There's going to be places where righteous can dwell, where people can live and work together and help each other and do things that, that are supportive of each other. And then there's the world, which is chaos and anger and hatred and sin and wickedness and all kinds of crazy stuff that's going on. So when we look at Latter-day Prophecy, we talk about this idea of the wheat and the tares, okay? Historically, whenever there's been a group of people that have been quite righteous, they and they grow up and then they have lots of people that are wicked around them, usually what can happen is they, they start to polarize and then they move away from each other. They realize we're not compatible. This isn't working. We need to, the best thing to do is just, we just need to part ways. So the wicked can do what they want and the righteous can do what they want. It's really hard for them to live together among each other because they're so fundamentally different. There's a lot of philosophies and beliefs and ideas that are not compatible and that they'll, they'll butt heads on. So it's just, let's just part ways. Let's just go our different ways. This is one of the challenges in the last days is that's not going to happen. So the, you know, usually... Uh, they break off. You know, Lehi and his family disagreed. They broke off. They went off in their in the wilderness their own ways. God led them out. The early saints, the 1800s, what did they do when when their views and the views of everybody else became in severe opposition? They left. They physically left and went somewhere else. They. This is what you know, we see this all the time in scriptures. You know, Enoch and his people. They grew up, they, they were together, but as the wicked became more wicked and the righteous became more white, wick, as the righteous became more righteous, sorry, they eventually just, it was easier to just part ways. So this happens a lot. Uh, the problem is in the last days, it's not going to happen. There is no parting of ways. So this is the wheat and the tares idea. Uh, the concept of the last days, they're going to grow up together and it's going to be hard to tell them apart. Wheat is what you want because it helps give you nutrients and things to sustain life. At least I should say the, the ancient wheat, modern wheat is not life sustaining at all. It's terrible. Unfortunately, um, it's most of the vitamins have been taken out of it, unfortunately. Um, but that's a whole other, whole other story. Um, and the tares is a plant that looks like wheat. And until they grow up and become fully ripe is the only time you can tell them apart. They're, they're not easy to tell. They look pretty similar the rest of the time as they grow. So, so now when the wheat and the tares become ripe, there isn't necessarily going to be a, a literal way for them to separate. They're going to stay together. And so this is where we get into this, the idea of the, you know, the, the gathering of Israel coming in and everything else coming in. We'll have to learn to live together to deal with this until God is able to sort them out. So this isn't a physical dis distancing. The coming of the Savior will be somewhat literal in that sense uh, when, he, when he literally comes. But before then, it will be people will be gathered in their places and try to kind of build their own little communities among everybody else around them, basically. This is where standing in holy places everywhere you are in the world is important. And so that's, that's what Isaiah 33 is getting at here is there's these two camps. There's Zion and then there's the world, basically. And these are the challenges. So that's that contrast we're going to see more in this chapter. Uh, let's look at verse 8. The highways lie waste. The wayfaring man ceaseth. He hath broken the covenant. He hath despised the cities. He regardeth no man. So here's the thing that's interesting. The highways lie waste. If the highways are wasted, there's no commerce. There's no traffic. There's no travel. People aren't moving around. There's not movement of goods. The merchants aren't coming around. Things aren't happening. As it talks about the wayfaring man ceaseth. Nobody's hitchhiking. Nobody's wandering. Nobody is exploring. We've got bigger problems. We've got much fundamental problems to society has broken down basically a lot of issues that are happening 
Uh, so uh, no normal day activities, basically. Uh, things have been destroyed to the point, again, commerce is not happening. This is probably due to war as well as natural disasters. So this is what this is what the last days is going to look like. Okay, we have economic prosperity right now. We have travel, we have commerce, we have things going on. But a day is coming in our future when it's going to be this barren, this desolate uh, that we're that we're learning about in here. This is the challenge. And so this is this is a good warning for us. That, I mean, this has always been a warning spiritually for people to think about how uh, righteousness versus wickedness is, an, is something to consider in our lives. But this is also going to be a challenge in our day and age, literally, too. So it's there's more polarization, more more righteous and more wicked at the same time. That that is there's going to be that more polarization that pull apart. Um, and so again. The wicked are going to be cursed. There's going to be lots of problems, lots of challenges, but the righteous are going to be praying for God's help in their life, praying for God to bless them and help them, and he will prosper his people or help them through these disasters and these challenges. Um, moving on here, verse 9, The earth mourneth and languisheth. Lebanon is ashamed and hewn down. Sharon is like a wilderness. Bashan and Carmel shake off their fruits. So this is the this is not a local disaster. This is global. There is major problems and challenges that are happening. Uh, Lebanon is ashamed and hewn down. We've always talked about the the cedars of Lebanon, these amazing trees that grow in Lebanon. They're going to be gone. Lebanon is going to be not worth much at this. You know, it's not. There's not much value there anymore. Uh, Sharon is going to be like a wilderness. So that's wild. No humans, no cultivation. It's going to be wild. Nature's going to be there. Animals will be moving around and doing things. Uh, Bashan and Carmel shake off their fruits. These are places where trees can grow, groves of trees with fruit and things on them. They will shake off their fruits. There's not going to be harvests. There's not going to be abilities to grow to do things so this could be droughts and famines and other things affecting the area as well so it's just talking about how the world is going to be in a really bad spot a really bad spot now verse 10 this is going to see a change in here now will i rise saith the lord now will i be exalted now will i lift up myself so this is the savior coming together so the lord will come back basically, in a day where what we call normal life does not exist anymore. Nations are destroyed, commerce has ceased, resources are ruined, and the land is bare. No harvest or growing, just what is left after a lot of destruction. That's what we have. That's what our future has in store, basically. And this is great. I mean, this is scary if you think about it. Um, but it's great that we have a chance to learn because, again, God is giving us the cliff notes here. He's saying, look, it's going to get bad. It's going to get really bad. But there's a way through it. And let me tell you how to do that. And that's where faith in God and, and prayer and repentance and humility comes into play. Uh, so verse 10 is talking about now God is saying, it's time for me to return. Uh, verse 11, ye shall conceive chaff. Ye shall bring forth stubble, your breath as fire shall devour you. And the people shall be as the burning of lime. As thorns cut up, shall they be burned in the fire. So that doesn't, those two, two verses don't sound any good. The wicked who remain will not be able to withstand the intensity of what's going on. And we talk about the wicked burning as fire and things burning as fire. And sometimes we, we want to think in a logical way and say maybe that's global warming. The, the earth heats up, it causes major disasters, famines, droughts, and that contributes to all of this happening. And maybe that whole idea of global warming is what we're talking about. And I think that, con that conceptually has something to play in the grander scheme of things. Um, I do think, though, what this is talking about is realizing that when Christ comes, Everybody that I have I have uh, learned about who has been in the presence of of Jesus Himself, like Joseph Smith and others, talk about a 
it's, it's not the same kind of light like you get from the sun. You know, when you go out in the sun and you feel the sun's light hit you, you can not just see it, but you feel it. You feel a heat building up in your, on your skin. Your skin gets warm. You can feel that heat. Uh, if you're really cold and you go out in the sun on a winter day, you feel that heat. You just want to absorb that heat in because it feels so good. There's a palatableness to that light. But what they've said is with Christ, that is so much more. Like it is so much more palatable. It is so much more to the point where it feels like your body is not just burning, like you have a skin burning, but like every cell in your body just wants to fly apart and go in different directions. It cannot help, it cannot sustain the amount of energy it's been that it's experiencing. And it's a whole body thing. It's not just like it says on the surface of your skin. Um, and so this could be as the Savior comes again, when he brings his light and power, that there's going to be a very real visceral reaction to people who are who are being severely wicked. Uh, and there's going to be some challenges and things that they will experience because of this. They are be, they are very unrefined and they are being uh, introduced into an environment that is highly refined and they just can't sustain that and it, it uh, they go away basically. Or as it talks about, like thorns cut up, they shall be burned in the fire. Um, so let's move forward here. Verse 13, hear ye that are far off. What have I done? And ye that are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? So verse 14 is a really interesting one to look at. Um, this idea of, let's talk first about everlasting burnings. This is a concept of what it feels like to be in the presence of God. His light and energy is so real and so strong that it literally can affect our energy and body. Doing spiritual things like keeping the commandments helps us be better prepared to handle this kind of real energy and allows God to help prepare our imperfect mortal self for a more perfect immortal presence. Uh, I, I unfortunately did not write down where I got that quote from, um, but a uh, great idea to think about. This idea of everlasting burnings is, what does it feel like to be in the presence of, of God? Like we, we've been discussing, this is the, there's a visceral, real presence. Uh, spiritually, we may feel inappropriate to be in the presence of God because of our wickedness and sins and things. Um, but this is, there's going to be a real effect on people because of this. Uh, and it's interesting, in, in the beginning of verse 14, it talks about the sinners in Zion. So people in Zion are not going to be perfect. People in Zion are, we're going to have a diversity of people in Zion as far as some might be super righteous, some might be a little righteous, but still got some problems. So sinners in Zion are afraid. I mean, Christ comes, we know when he comes, it is going to be, uh, they, they, the scriptures reference it as a thief in the night. So as he comes, it is basically going to be a time where we are not thinking about it. We are not going to assume he's coming at that time. Now, if you're a thief and you want to break into somebody's home, you want to break in at a time that is most advantageous to you to accomplish your purpose. So you want to come at a time when people are the, the weakest, when the, you know, the homeowners or the, the people in the home are not home or not paying attention. So this is why oftentimes robberies happen at night because there's more darkness to hide, more easy, it's easier to conceal, harder to be seen. Uh, and the people are asleep. So you have a chance of getting in, getting stuff, and getting out without them even realizing you're there. They're not up watching for you. If you knew they were up watching for you, you'd pick a different house. So this is a, a good thing for us to think about is Christ is going to come in a time that we're not anticipating it. So how's the best way, if you think about the robbery men, uh, metaphor, how's the best way to be prepared for robber? You have to prepare every day. You have to be ready before the robber shows up. So if you believe, you have to think about, if a robber comes into my house, how are they going to come in? 
What's going to happen? When will they come in? Oh, maybe they'll come in at night. Okay, maybe they'll come in the day when we're all gone for the day. So what do we do? Do we need cameras? Do we need improved door locks? Do we need alarm systems? Do we need to do improve the, the, the bolts on our doors or whatever? So that's the thing you need to think about is being prepared in case the robber shows up. So we need to be prepared, not in case Christ shows up, but when Christ shows up. We know he's coming. We know that is going to happen. When, we don't really know. That's the challenge. We don't know. And the scriptures tell us this a lot. So uh, if you want, watch. We have a video we did. I did a while ago about Latter-day Prophecy. And this is one of the things we talked about in that video, is realizing that there are sometimes people who think they can time the coming of the Savior. They think they can use numerology or astrology or or other types of ologies or other apocryphal writings to predict when Christ comes or whatever. Um, they're all wrong. And the scriptures literally tell us he'll come as a thief in the night. If you could predict when he'll come, then you'll stay up that night. You'll sleep fine the rest of the nights, but that night you'll stay up. But that's not what's going to happen. So he doesn't, it's not about surprising us. It's about encouraging us to be always prepared for his coming. So there's two ways to think about his coming. One is his literal coming, which is what we're talking about in Isaiah 33. The other one is when you die, you are severely limited in your ability to make changes and repent because you have no physical body. So, dying is another opportunity that God wants us to be prepared for. We don't know when we're going to die, so it's important that we stay ready to meet God all the time. We want to make our peace long before that moment. So, that's an important thing to, to really think about. Um, but there are, like verse 14 says, sinners in Zion. There's going to be imperfect people in Zion. Don't think of Zion as a perfect people. Think of it as a bunch of people. Some are better than others as far as their level of spirituality, but some are going to still have challenges to be overcome. Uh, and, and it goes on to here to say, fearful, fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. So again, people who thought, who would teach you to do it one way, but then do it another way. So these are the teachers. These are the instructors. These are the people who are acting religious, but aren't truly religious inside they're going to be surprised. They probably went, oh, I thought I had more time. Nope. You ran out of time. You were not prepared. So this is a good question for us to think about. Again, who and who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? This is the question. Which one of us, and this is a question for you to ask, want to experience the second coming with fear and trembling? Hopefully none of us do. And if that's the case, then we need to be proactive. We need to be working on it. This is where keeping the commandments makes a difference. Keeping the commandments isn't just about the commandments. Keeping the commandments is about actually helping us prepare us. Because there, when, God, when God puts a law in place, there are spiritual results that come with it. As we keep the commandments, it actually helps us to be better prepared to withstand those everlasting burnings. I mean, this is, I think, more than the more than maybe a threat of literal burning to death in the presence of God. Um, think about what it would be like to live in the presence of God with a full understanding of your sins. That's probably worse, honestly, than, than a physical destruction. Because physical destruction eventually ends when you're when you're destroyed, but living, knowing full well what your sins are, and living in the presence of God is gotta be just devastating. That's just gotta be horrible. Because there's no end to that. That's everlasting burnings and fires and things if you're not careful. Now, verse 15, we're gonna move on here, and it says, "He that walketh righteously, and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions." that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. 
Bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. This is so important for us to look at. Okay, because again, this is the righteous, the people who have relied on God. These are the people in Zion who are, again, walking righteously. They're keeping the commandments. They're speaking uprightly. They're being honest and using integrity in what they do. They despise the gain of oppressions. They're not trying to get one over on people. They're trying to help people. He shaketh his hands from holding of bribes. Again, he's not, he's like, nope, not, I'm not dealing dishonestly. I'm having integrity. Stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood. War. He is avoiding war. Not listening to the destructions of war, not wanting to get involved in the rhetoric and the challenges of war. Uh, and then shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. He is purposely saying, I don't want to look at that. I don't want to look at that. You know, this is, I think this is a great one for our internet day and age is to ask yourself. Here's the thing to ask yourself. Whenever you see a link that is alluring, whether that's pornography, whether that's to see the despise, of, you know, demise of somebody else, like, oh, come watch this video. This person gets destroyed or whatever, uh, you know, or watch this fight or, you know, come gamble or come do this or come do that or whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. Whatever the sin is that they're trying to encourage you to click that link. Here's the thing to realize. If the whole reason you're going to click that link is to go do something, see something, experience something that is against what God says, just don't click it. It's that easy. It's That's the way we should be thinking, I think. I know it's in reality a little harder than that to do, um, but that's what you should do. Like, oh, this is an image of going to look at a member of the opposite sex with very little clothes on. If that's the whole reason I'm going to look at, click this image is to see something that is inappropriate, then I shouldn't click it in the first place. Let's just stop it right there before we get into it and then go, oh, no, I saw it. Now I have a response to it. Now I got to deal with that. And I didn't like that. That wasn't good. Let's not lie to each other or especially not lie to ourselves. Okay. You click the link because you wanted to see it. There's something that you felt was value to you, an emotional response you wanted to have inside. That's why you click that link is because you like the feeling it gives you. Just be aware of that. Just be aware of that. Okay. And then admit though, if that's not, even though that might feel good or feel a certain way that you enjoy, if God says that's not the thing we should be feeling, or that's not the way thing we should be experiencing, we have to realize that and go, okay, God doesn't want me to feel that way. God doesn't want me to experience that feeling and go that direction. So just, I'm just not going to click the link. The more you get that in your mind of that honesty and integrity of, with yourself to work on that, the better it will be in the long run. It'll make a big difference. Uh, Bruce R. McConkie had some interesting things to say about this as well. Uh, even talking about the everlasting uh, burnings, he says, uh, who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Verse 14, he says, that is, who in the church shall gain an inheritance in the celestial kingdom? Who will go where God and Christ and holy beings are? Who will overcome the world, work the works of righteousness and enduring in faith and devotion to the end, hear the blessed benediction, come and inherit the kingdom of my father? Isaiah answers in Isaiah 33, 15 through 16, basically. And so this was a, that was a conference report uh, Bruce Homer Conkey did in 1973. And then he continues on, he says, if, if I may... I shall take these words of Isaiah spoken by the power of the Holy Ghost in the first instance and give some indication as to how they apply to us and our circumstances. First, he that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, that is, building on the atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must keep the commandments. We must speak the truth and work the works of righteousness. We shall be judged by our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. Second, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that is, we must act with equity and justice toward our fellow men. It is the Lord himself who said that he at the day of his coming will be a swift witness against those that oppress the hireling in his wages. Third, he that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that is, we must reject every effort to buy influence 
and instead deal fairly and impartially with our fellow men. Well, that goes against a lot of politics these days. Holy cow. God is no respecter of persons. He esteemeth all flesh alike, and those only who keep his commandments find special favor with him. Salvation is free. It cannot be purchased with money, and those only are saved who abide the law upon which its receipt is predicated. Bribery is of the world. Fourth, he that stoppeth his ears from hearing blood and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, that is, we must not center our attention on evil and wickedness. We must cease to find fault and good and look for good in government and in the world. We must take an affirmative, wholesome approach to all things. That was all from his 1973 conference report in October. Um, that's exactly what he's talking about here. These are the people who will dwell in everlasting burnings because not because they got destroyed, they couldn't sustain themselves in those burnings and go away, but they were prepared for an, a, a spiritual existence. Keeping the commandments is a refining process. Having faith in God and building that faith in God is a refining process. And that process is helping us to be prepared so we can live in everlasting burnings without having a problem. The everlasting burnings are coming. The only question is, are we going to have a problem with it or are we going to be okay with it? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. So realize when you keep the commandments, every time you keep the commandments and you keep working on that and exercising your faith and doing more, you are preparing your body to withstand the presence of Christ. He is coming. Now, if you look at the example of the, uh, the logo, I guess you'd say, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the typical logo that we have used for a very long time is Moroni, the angel Moroni up on the temple using his horn. What was the point of his of that? That whole the whole idea of Moroni up there with his horn is announcing Christ is coming. Tell everybody, Christ is coming. What's the new, the new icon or the new branding that we have for the church? Christ appearing. He's walking through a door to come to us. That door is going to be the door of a temple, most likely, coming to us. But that is him coming. We are way closer to him coming than ever before. And so that's why this uh, chapter is so relevant, so important to our day and age to understand. Uh, so let's continue on with verse 16. He shall dwell on high. Oh, wait, no, I read that one. 17, sorry. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. Thine heart shall meditate terror. Where is the scribe? Where is the receiver? Where is he that counted the towers? So these are government positions to see that things are getting done properly, like taxes, commerce, those kinds of things, they are going to, it's going to be just different, basically. It's going to be a very different time. Uh, but those who can withstand that everlasting burnings, who can withstand the spirituality, who've been ready and prepared, will rejoice and be excited about this time. Those who aren't prepared, those who are still worried about worldly things and worldly mentalities are going to have a hard time with this. They're going to find this time a very fearful, panicky time. So that's it. here. If you think about the future and this stuff happening, if this scares you, maybe let's make sure we're on this side. Let's be, let's get over here where we have that righteousness, where we can be more excited about it. Yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, it's going to be terrible and challenging, but we're excited for the benefits of what is coming. So verse 19, thou shalt not see a fierce people, a people of a steeper speech than thou canst perceive, of a stammering tongue that thou canst not understand. This is the people of Zion will not be a fierce people or warlike. They will be clear and easy to understand. They will teach things that make sense and are not hard to understand. So the people of Zion are going to be people who have a lot of common sense who are not warlike. They're not seeking to destroy. They're not seeking to fight and bring about the battles of God. 
This is such a misnomer we have in the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints and in Christianity as a whole. Uh, we believe in this idea of warriors of God, that as God comes, there's an army that is going to come out and we are going to basically vanquish the wicked and prepare for this to happen. No, no, that's not what it's telling us. It's telling us that we're going to be the people who will be with God are not the people who are warlike. It's not going to be the people that will do the fighting. God will take care of the wicked. He will allow the wicked to destroy the wicked. The wicked want to fight. The wicked want to have battles. The wicked want to have war. God does not. He's not going that direction. He wants us to love each other. He wants us to help each other. And if we put our faith in him, he will help us. Even if our faith means losing our life. Put your faith in God. That's important. Uh, verse 20, Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. Now, Bruce R. McConkie had something to say about this verse as well. So let's, I want to read what he said. He said, in prophetic imagery, Zion is pictured as a great tent upheld by cords fastened securely to stakes. Thus Isaiah, envisioning the latter-day glory of Israel, gathered to her restored Zion, proclaimed, Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. That's coming up in Isaiah 54. Uh, and of the millennial Zion, Isaiah exalted, look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. That's this chapter, 33 we're talking about. So he continues, in keeping with this symbolism, the great areas of church population and strength which sustain and uphold the restored Zion are called stakes. They are rallying points and the gathering centers for the remnants of scattered Israel. This is out of Mormon Doctrine, page 764. So verse 20 is again talking about, look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. This is the new Jerusalem, okay, Jackson County, Missouri. Thine eye shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation. That is old Jerusalem. So Zion is new Jerusalem. Jerusalem is old Jerusalem. The old Jerusalem will be a quiet habitation. Boy, what has to happen for Jerusalem to be a quiet place? <laughs> Quite a bit. If you look at today's world and what's going on in uh, 2023, here towards the end of 2023, early 2024, man, it is not quiet over there. It's We've got challenges and problems. But here's what's fun is a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. That's temple. So there will be a temple. There will be more opportunities to teach the gospel and do more. Um, and I like this, that the, on top of the temple, this idea of the gospel is like a tabernacle, like a big tent that keeps getting bigger as the message spreads as more members are there, there's more stakes in the ground because it is a bigger tent. It's more inclusive. You could say the LDS church is a big tent people. We want to be inclusive of people, not exclusive of people. Now think about that. God wants us to be an inclusive people not an exclusive people. We should be looking for what are the reasons that people should be a part of our church, not what are the reasons they should be kicked out of our church or not welcome at church. So I, that's important. Now, this I might get in a little trouble with this, but here's the reality is this is the scriptures. This is the truth, okay? And you can't go up to anybody and tell them this, but this is the thing you need to think about, okay? If you have those thoughts in your mind of certain people should not be welcome at church, you might want to realize that that's not what we're, what Isaiah is talking about. Isaiah is going to tell you, you should think about why should they be at church, not who should be excluded. 
because you think different than me, whether that's in today's world, that's, you know, if you are a liberal, you're a Democrat or whatever, you should be kicked out. No, you should embrace them. We should bring them in and go, how can I understand truth from your perspective as well? How can I continue to further my understanding of the gospel as I learn from you? And how can you learn from me? How can we come together? If they are of a different race or nationality, again, how can we come together to learn from each other's cultures and traditions and ideas? If they are of a different, uh, I guess you could say in today's world, sexual orientation, how can we learn from each other? How can we invite them in to come together? This is big tent thinking, and this is exactly what Zion is, is big tent. How can we be inclusive? How can we help people be with us? Not exclusive. Exclusive thinking is not a part of the gospel at all, especially in the latter days. So be careful with exclusive thinking or people that are trying to say, here's who can come and here's who can't come to church. That's not the right way to think. That's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to be inclusive in our thinking. Uh, and if you have a different opinion of this, you are more than welcome to put them in the comments. Um, but I'm going to ask you to back it up with doctrinal teachings and ideas. Because again, this is, this is all over. This is in Isaiah and it's in several other places. Big tent thinking. Be inclusive. Um, so that's important. If this is standing in holy places, this is being a part of Zion, be in the tent if you want to be spared from the craziness that is out there. So we get a glimpse so far of there is craziness. There's chaos. There's stuff going on. But we're learning about how, where does God want us to be? He wants us to be in the tent, in Zion. Be here. Not everybody's going to be perfect in here. There will be sinners in Zion. But be here. Work with us. All right, verse 21. But there the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams, wherein shall go no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ships pass thereby. 21 is an interesting one. Uh, talking about the Lord will provide great resources to help the people. Broad rivers are often used for lots of fishing and irrigation as well as transportation and commerce. So this is the thing to think about, okay? In, in verse 21, God will provide resources. He will provide help for us. This is so amazing. Let's say war destroys our country. Commerce falls apart completely. What are we going to rely on? How do we take care of our own needs? This goes back to something Brigham Young talked about a lot with the early saints because they literally went through this when they moved to the Utah Valley. They had to learn how to make clothes. They had to learn how to build factories, how to build, get the tools, machine things, put it together to build, to make the commerce happen in their areas. And they were blessed with that. They were blessed with understanding Brigham Young. There's many stories of Brigham Young telling people, go to this place, gather gold from this mine and bring it. We need to pay our bills. We need to do these things to build up the commerce. Here, go here. Here's where these ores are kept. We can mine this ore. We can use this to build with or to construct with or do things with. So God is going to provide for us these things. Just like when Nephi, he and Lehi and their whole family, they left Jerusalem, they went out in the wilderness. They didn't know where they were going. They had no idea what was in store for them. God did not tell Lehi, hey Lehi, I want you to take your family out in the wilderness. And by the way, you're going to forget a couple of things. So I'll send your, have you send your kids back to get them. And then I'm going to make you tell you guys to build a boat and then you're going to sell for about a year across the waters and not see land for a while. And then you're going to get in the land and then it's going to be a great place. No, he didn't tell him that. God didn't tell Lehi that. God told Lehi, get your family, get out of Jerusalem. And so he did. And then he got out of Jerusalem and God said, go this direction. And then he went that direction. And then they got to a place and he said, build a boat. And then they built the boat. Now, God didn't build the boat for them. God grew the trees and placed the ore in the earth so they could build it themselves. Such a powerful metaphor for us in our day and age. Okay, well, Always remember, God doesn't create boats. God grows trees and teaches us how to build the boat. Very important point. 
That is so important for us to understand, okay? This is what verse 21 in, in Isaiah 33 is talking about. God will give us the resources. He knows where all the gold is. He knows where the iron is. He knows where the copper is. He knows where all this is. He can teach us and help us to know what to do. He will provide for us. It's already taken care of. He's got a plan. We just need to follow his plan and have the trust in him to just go to the next step. He can he sees the whole plan all the way out. Prophets can see further than the rest of us. That's where we have that faith to just keep moving to the next step. We don't need to see the whole path as long as we trust his next step. Have that faith. Keep moving forward. Because again, this is how we are going to survive the last days. President Nelson has made a comment, and I can't tell you how many times this has been repeated, uh, re-quoted in articles and in talks, like general conference talks. It's, it, we hear at least two or three times every general conference since President Nelson has made this comment. Uh, and hopefully that repetition is helping to solidify in our brains that what President Nelson told us several years ago was there will come a time where basically Without the Holy Ghost, you will not be able to survive the stuff that's coming. The destruction, the, the challenges to your faith, the issues that are coming, you need to have the Holy Ghost as a guide. Why do we need to have the Holy Ghost as our guide in these challenging times? Verse 21 just told us what is going to happen. This whole chapter is telling us, look, there's crap all over the place. There's stuff happening. It's destruction. It's chaos. Wars famines, pestilence, it's bad. But let me give you a glimpse of what Zion will be like. Let me tell you what is really going to be like. I want you here. Yes, this is here. I want you focused here. That's what this is all about, is to help us realize, oh my gosh, we are getting to that point of all that crazy destruction. But focus on being a part of Zion. That's where God wants us to be. If we focus on that, everything else will work out. He will take care of us. This is what verse 21 is all about. Now, verse 22 is going to give us more insight into this too. He says, verse 22, For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Now, that is very true spiritually and literally. He will come at a time where it will be despondent and terrible and bad. He will help us to improve the city of New Jerusalem. In fact, old Zion, the one from uh, um, Enoch's time, is going to, suppose, this is from, from what we hear, they are in heaven. This, the city that got taken to heaven, they were so righteous. They'll come down, join with New Jerusalem, help build New Jerusalem better. Christ will then come to the temple in New Jerusalem. It will be awesome. It will be amazing. You will be safe and have peace and happiness there. Be there. Work on yourself. Keep working on yourself. Just like he said, not everybody that's going to be in Zion is going to be perfect. Sinners will still be in Zion. But there is an opportunity to continue to repent and improve. And that's through the atonement of Jesus Christ. That is so important. Now verse 23, thy tacklings are loosed. Now that's good, not good. If you know what tackling is on a boat, tacklings are loose. If your tacklings are loosed, you're going to have problems. You can't get the cells set right. You're going to have issues. Uh, they could not well strengthen their mast. They could not spread the cell. Then is the prey of a great spoil divided. The lame take the prey. And the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. So the people will be healthy and free of sin. That's the millennium. So again, that's what's going to happen. Verse 23 is, in, is that uh, reference back saying, oh, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be chaos. If your tackling gets loosed, you could the wind could catch the wrong way, move your ship the wrong way, capsize your ship if you're not careful, break your mast. You're, they could not well strengthen their mast. You're going to have problems. It's total chaos. But God will save you. That is what we're talking about. Isaiah 33 is for our very near future. Now, when? I, I can't tell you. I, I can't tell you. There's a lot that's going to happen, okay? In my studies and understanding of the old, uh, not just Old Testament, but of the Latter-day prophecy, there's a lot that we have to go through. 
but it can all happen in a short period of time. It doesn't take much. If you look at history of some of the destructions and challenges that have happened in the past, it doesn't take much for this to happen. I mean, if you look even the book of Ether, the Jaredites, this wasn't like, you know, they fought and fought and fought for decades. That just become almost became their culture to just fight each other all the time. They did it so often. But the ultimate destruction at the last part didn't take long at all. It was a couple of years at best. So it doesn't take much. It, things can change quickly. Pompeii was very transformed in a matter of a couple of hours. By the end of the day, Pompeii and Herculaneum ceased to exist at the end of a 24-hour period, less than 24 hours. Things can change quite fast. So this is why we need to be prepared. It's not going to be easy to tell when Christ comes again, but we can see what's going on. So realize when we talk about Latter-day prophecy that there are snapshots and there is uh, of what is going to happen. And then there's the event of like the process of what is happening. Isaiah 33 is telling us the process. Here's the, here's some of the things that are going to happen. Here's here's kind of the the flow of things, but we don't have a lot of clear specific snapshots of what exactly is going to happen. Okay, they're they're different, and how to match them up? I think God keeps those separate. He gives us specifics of certain things that are going to happen, but then he also tells us kind of the general pattern of what's going to happen. But he doesn't match those together on purpose. Lots of people try, they write lots of books, create lots of podcasts and videos and websites and stuff saying this is the order they're going to happen in. Like Dwayne Crowther, his, his famous book, Prophecy Key to the Future, his first chapter's wrong. He wrote it in the 70s, almost 40 years ago, his first chapter's already wrong. It was wrong decades ago. So that's, he, God is keeping us guessing because again, the point isn't to know the moment. The point is to always be ready for the moment. That's what he wants us to do and put our faith in him that we'll follow his plan and do it the way he says to do it. Now let's jump over to our next chapter as we continue to learn more.